Hello, welcome back to my class. This is Introduction to Linguistic Course. It is the second meeting of our class, and today we are going to discuss the origins of language. In Charles Darwin's visions of the origins of language, early humans had already developed musical ability prior to language and were using it to charm each other. This may not match the typical image that most of us have of our early ancestors as rather rough characters, wearing animal skins and not very charming. But it is an interesting speculation about how language may have originated. It remains, however, a speculation. We simply don't know how language originated. We do know that the ability to produce sounds and simple vocal patterning, a home versus a crown, for example, appears to be in an ancient part of the brain that we share with all vertebrates, including fish, frog, bird, and other mammals. But that is not the human language. Yet, among the stresses of earlier periods of life on Earth, we never find any direct evidence of artifacts relating to the speech of our distant ancestor that might tell us how language was back in the early stages. Perhaps because of this absence of direct physical evidence, there has been no shortage of speculation about the origins of human speech. So, there are some theories related to the origin of language. The first one is Divine Source. In the biblical tradition, as described in the book of Genesis, God created Adam, and whatsoever Adam called every living creature that was the name thereof. Alternatively, following a Hindu tradition, language came from Saraswati wife of Brahma, creator of the universe. And in most of religions, there appears to be a divine source who provides human with language in an attempt to rediscover this original divine language, a few experiments have been carried out with rather conflicting results. The basic hypothesis seems to have been that if human infants were allowed to grow up without hearing any language around them, then they would spontaneously begin using the original God-given language. The Greek writer Herodotus reported to the story of an Egyptian pharaoh named Samadikus, who tried the experiment with new newborn babies more than 2015 years ago. After two years of isolation, except for the common of goats and the mute tapir, the children were reported to have spontaneously uttered not an Egyptian word but something that was identified as the Phrygian's word because means bread. The pharaoh concluded that religions and other language spoken in part of what is modern Turkey must be the original language. That seems very unlikely. The children may not have picked up this word from any human source. But as several commentators have pointed out, they must have heard that the good were saying. The second experiment was conducted by the King James IV of Scotland that carried out the similar experiments. The children were reported to have spontaneously talking, speaking Hebrew, confirming the king's belief that Hebrew had indeed the language of the Garden of Eden. But it is unfortunate that all other cases of children who have been discovered living in isolation without coming into contact with human speech turn out to confirm the result of these types of divine source experiments. 
very young children living without access to human language in their early years grew up with no language at all. If human language did emanate from a divine source, we have no way of reconstructing the originals of language, especially given the events in a place called Babel, because the Lord did there confirm the language of all the herb. And then, the next theory is called the natural sound source. A quite different view of the beginnings of language is based on uh, the concept of natural sounds. The basic idea is that primitive words could have been imitation of the natural sounds which only men and women heard around them. When an object flew by making a caca sound, the early human tried to imitate the sound and used it to refer to the thing associated with the sound. And when other flying creatures made a cuckoo sound, the natural sound was adopted to refer to that kind of object. The fact that all modern languages have some word with pronunciation that seem to echo naturally occurring sounds could be used to support this theory. In English, in addition to kaku, we have splash, bang, boom, rattle, buzz, hiss, and extra. Words that sound similar to the noises that describes are examples of onopopeia. And then, the next one. is the social interaction source. Another proposal involving natural sounds has been called yu he ho theory. The idea is that the sounds of a person involved in a physical effort could be the source of our language, especially when that physical effort involved several people and the interactions had no be coordinated. So, a group of early human might develop a set of homes, crowns, crowns, and courses that were used when they were lifting and carrying large feet or trees or lifeless hairy mammoths. The appeal of this proposal is that it places the development of human language in a social context. Early people must have lived in a group. If only because larger groups offer better protection from attack. Groups are necessary social organizations, and to maintain those organizations, some form of communication is required, even if it is just current or curses. So, human sound, however they are produced, must have some principles used within the life and social interactions of early human groups. And then, the next theory is physical adaptation source. Instead of looking at types of sounds and the source of human speech, we can look at the types of physical features human possess especially those that are distinct from other creatures, which may have been able to support speech production. We can start with the observation that, at some early stage, our ancestors made a very significant transition to an upright posture with bipedal locomotion, and a revised rule for the front limb. Some effects of this type of change can be seen in physical differences between the skill of gorilla and that a Netherlands man human teeth are upright not slanting outwards like those of apes and they are roughly even in height such characteristics of not very useful for ripping or tethering food and seem better adapted for grinding and chewing. 
They are also very helpful in making sounds such of. Human lips have much more intricate muscles interlacing than is found in other primates, and their resulting flexibility certainly helps in making sounds like up or up. The mouth, tongue, and larynx or voice box bring significant development to produce any sound. And then we go to the next theory between the two making sounds. In the physical adaptation view, one functions must have been superimposed on existing anatomic features, teeth or lips. Previously used for another purpose, chewing. A similar development is believed to have taken place with human hands, and some believe that manual gestures may have been a procedure of language. The human brain is not only large relative to human body size; it's also lateralized. And then. The next one is the genetic sorrows. We can think of the human baby in its first features as a living example of some of these physical changes taking place. At birth, the baby's brain is only a quarter of its eventual weight, and the larynx is much higher in the throat. Allowing babies like chimpanzees to breathe and drink at the same time. In a relatively short period of the time, the larynx descends, the brain develops, and the child assumes to upright posture and start walking and talking. This almost automatic set of development and complexity and the young child's language have led some scholars to look for something more powerful. The small physical adaptation of the species over time as the source of language. It is innate. No other creature seems to have it, and it's tied to the specific variety of language. Is it possible that that language capacity is genetically hardwired in the newborn humans? As a solution to the puzzle of the origins of language. This innocent hypothesis would seem to point something in human genetics, possible of crucial mutation, as the souls. I think there are some theories related to the origin of language. As a preview, there are divine souls, the natural sound souls, the social interaction souls, the physical adaptation souls. The two making souls, and then the last one, the genetic souls. I think that's all for today. Thank you.